Welcome to the fifth annual Indian Summer Festival. And some of you welcome back. You were here with us recently for the fabulous talk with Murga, the menstrual man. Um, I'm Shelley Dewan, and I'm a member of the Indian Summer Arts Society Board of Directors. Thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, we would like to recognize it's really them. It's hard to describe you. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, okay, I feel better now. <laughs> Everybody's laughing, that's good. Before we begin, we would like to recognize the Musqueam, Skohamish, and tsleil nations on whose unceded traditional lands we live, work, and play. Indian Summer Festival brings the world to Vancouver from July 9th through 18th through a series of provocative multi-arts events featuring international visionaries and minds from South Asia, Canada, and beyond. Um, but we couldn't do it without some very important partners, so we would like to thank our festival partners our premier partner, Simon Fraser University, uh, the Georgia Strait, Spice Radio, CBC, City of Vancouver, the Department of Canadian Heritage, and the province of British Columbia. And a big shout out and thank you to tonight's event partners, uh, the US Consulate, the British Columbia Council for International Education, uh, Van City Center for Community Engagement, SFU Woodwards, Vancouver Observer, and Room to Read. If you are on social media, tonight's hashtags are hashtag ISF ideas and hashtag where worlds meet. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Am Jo Hall from the Van City Office of Community Engagement at the SFU Woodward, Woodward's Cultural Unit to speak for a few moments. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's absolutely delightful that so many of you could uh, join us uh, here and uh, we're absolutely uh, delighted uh, as part of uh, my office to be partnered for the fifth year in a row with the Indian Summer Festival. The first uh, meeting that uh, I had with Sarish uh, was back in March of 2011. Uh, both Sarish and Laura have been such wonderful partners. They've become wonderful friends and it's been great to uh, also have the opportunity to go to Jaipur to the Literary Festival, which they've also been involved with. It's been wonderful to see this festival grow. It's really become uh, part of the fabric uh, of the city. And so thank you to, to both of you, first of all. Uh, and uh, my office uh, partnered uh, on this talk uh, as well as Van City uh, Credit Union. They've been a strong supporter of my office uh, based here out of uh, the Woodward's building from the very beginning. Uh, this credit union, which has half a million uh, members in the region, $16 billion in asset that's so involved in social enterprise, social purpose, real estate, impact investing, all of those great things are very much tied to uh, the talk uh, that will be happening this evening. So uh, please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Am. So now the reason we're all here, uh, Jessica Jackley believes that many of the most inspiring entrepreneurs in the world are not focused on high-tech ventures or making a lot of money. Instead, they wake up every day and build better lives for themselves, their families, and their communities. In her first published book, Clay Water Brick, Jackley challenges readers to embrace entrepreneurship as a powerful force for change in the world. She shares her own story of founding micro-lending site Kiva with little more than a laptop and a dream. And the stories, um, sorry, and the stories and the lessons she has learned from those across the globe who are doing the most with the least. She's spoken around the world about social entrepreneurship and today she's here at the Indian Summer Festival. So please join me in welcoming Jessica Jackley. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. <laughs> We were giggling in the corner. I was trying to get the audience rowdy before I got on the stage. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I've been looking forward to this ever since my husband was here last year and has had only wonderful things to say about it. He also, by the way, will be speaking right after me, so you should stay. <laughs> we're we're a, a team here. I want to tell you about this book that I wrote, Clay Water Brick. And I'd like to tell you, in particular, about two stories to kick this off two entrepreneur stories who inspired this book. Among the hundreds and thousands of entrepreneurs that I've met over the last decade, there are, I have to admit, a few that are, are my favorites. And these two stories, for me, really have bookended my experience as an entrepreneur, working with very poor entrepreneurs. So I'd like to dive right in and tell you the first. And it's a story of a gentleman I met named Patrick. Patrick lived in a, 
a village on the border of Kenya and Uganda. And I met him several years ago, actually about 10 years ago, at the beginning of uh, my career as I was really starting off. And his story has always stayed with me. He explained to me how he had fled from the northern area of the country to the village where I found him with nothing. He had left after a rebel group had attacked his village. And unfortunately, he lost almost all of his family, but he was able to flee with his brother, made it all the way to this other area of the country, and settled with distant cousins. He wanted to be near family after what he had been through, any family at all. And he had no, you know, very little education, no money to speak of, the clothes on his back, he was hungry, he was homeless, he was newly orphaned, he was very young. He had really very, very little. And a lot of people, I think, would have looked at his life and said, this guy is nothing. This situation is hopeless. But Patrick didn't believe either of those things. So he told me that one day he sort of had this epiphany. He was sitting, thinking about how he would feed himself and his brother that day, as he did every single day. And he was kind of wondering about what his plan would be. He sort of rested his hand on the ground next to him where, where he was sitting, leaning his back against this mud structure where, he, where they slept. And he sort of looked down to his hand and felt the earth between, beneath his fingertips and started to dig, literally. Not just cliche, roll your sleeves up, get your, hand, get your hands dirty. He literally started to dig. He found a, a piece of wood and then sort of a scrap of metal and, and used those as homemade kind of implements to dig more. And as he dug, he learned. He learned that there were some clay deposits in the earth and that that clay, when it was mixed with water, could be shaped. And of course, Patrick decided to shape that clay into brick. Now, at first, his bricks were rough and misshapen, and they cracked and crumbled easily. But he soon figured out how to get, how to get better and better at that. Um, and he practiced every day. And soon he was able to sell the bricks, just for a fraction of a penny each. But it was enough to get started. So he sold those bricks, was able to start to save up, again, these tiny, tiny little bits of money. But it was enough to be able to afford this brick mold, um, one that looked just like this. And so suddenly his production doubled. The bricks that he made, not only could he do two at a time, he could do it much, much more quickly. And the bricks that he made were evenly and consistently shaped and sized. And guess what? They sold for a little bit more. So when he sold those bricks and saved up that money, um, you know, he was able to start doing better and better very, very quickly. He knew that he could dry the bricks in the sun, and that's what he had done. I mean, he lived in equatorial <laughs> Uganda. It was great resource, free resource, to dry the bricks that way. But he knew that if he could bake the bricks in a sort of self-contained kiln, that he could sell them for even more. So he saved up again, went to a nearby village and sort of apprenticed with somebody there, learned how to do this, went back to his own village, baked the bricks. And of course, you can see where this story goes. He sold those bricks for even more. Time passed, and he was eventually able to hire his brother, and then a neighbor, and then another. And he was able to replace his homemade implements with real tools, a shovel and a trowel, and all the things that made him feel like a much more professional and official business person. And again, when I met Patrick, it, it had been several years after he had begun this great business that had changed everything in his life. And he showed me not just these sorts of things and how things changed for him uh, with his business implements, but he showed me a new home that he had built with baked mud bricks that he had pulled from the earth with his own two hands. Now, if that's not entrepreneurial, I'm not sure what it is. So that's Patrick just one of so many entrepreneurs I've had the privilege to meet. Now, the other entrepreneur I want to tell you about um, right now is Fatuma. And I met F Fatuma about 700 miles-ish due south of where I'd met Patrick. I'm going to digress, though, for a minute and tell you why I was there anyway. Why was I <laughs> tromping around East Africa throughout Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania 10 years ago interviewing entrepreneurs, meeting with these amazing people? Well, I was working with a nonprofit called Village Enterprise based out of the Bay Area in California. And they are a phenomenal, phenomenal organization that has pioneered something called micro grants, not loans. You know, we'll talk about that later. Microfinance, sort of this broad uh, heading, this broad term for the collection of financial services and products, not just microcredit, which sometimes people interchange those words, but not just small loans for the entrepreneurial poor, but savings programs, insurance programs, things like that. This micro grants program that Village Enterprise has pioneered is, is unique because it gets to people who are too afraid to even take a loan and it gets them to the first rung on the economic ladder. Often the grants are just 100, maybe $150 now. They've kind of gone up over the years to 150. But when I worked with them 10 years ago, they were $100 to start a tiny business or to turn sort of the business activities that these amazing entrepreneurs in very rural areas were doing into something that could allow for a sustainable livelihood for them and their families. So I was there 
working with this great organization, interviewing entrepreneurs, and asking them really basic questions. Did you get that $100? It was kind of a survey. Did you get the money? How did you use it? Did it help things change for your business, change and grow and improve for you? What's different in your life now that you've had this opportunity to grow this amazing enterprise? Um, as I met those individuals, I heard incredible stories, and these are just two of them that I'm sharing with you uh, right now. So Fatuma, I was there, I had a job to do. I wanted to learn about her business. Had she gotten the money, et cetera, et cetera. So I pull up, or <laughs> I, I walk up actually. She lived in a pretty remote area, and um, it was sort of this interesting process of going from you know a bus. Well, first I had to fly there, so a big plane, a bus to a car, to like a motorbike, and then I just walked <laughs> through the village to get to where she was. And this is not her home, but I, um, I pulled up to this mud hut. And I don't know how many of you have spent significant time in mud huts. I'm kind of a connoisseur. And hers was not exactly like this, because she was in Tanzania. It was a lot drier. The roof was flatter. But just to give you a feel for where I was, looks eh, kind of ish like this. And on the inside, you might be thinking, oh, this really warm and bright, well-lit space with lots of little you know, things, little implements that you might have inside your home. Hers did not look like this, unfortunately. She was very much um, right near the bottom of, uh, in terms of poverty, the kind of bottom of the, um, yeah, the, the bucket, I guess, of, in terms of her level of need. And so hers did not look like that. Hers instead looked a lot more like this. So she pulls me into this very bare space. We sit down, there are two folding chairs, a little table, and a mattress. On, in the corner, and that was basically it. And we sit down, and she starts to talk to me profusely about the kind of amazing things that she's been doing with her business. And I asked to see records, so she showed me these little blue books. I don't know if this is just if this was just me, <laughs> an American middle school ish for me thing, twenty some years ago. But I, I used to write my like middle school essays in these blue books. So I had sort of a stress reaction when I saw them, <laughs> but it was not pop quiz time. She had kept her records with a little pencil stub. She had written her records in this book, and she showed me how incredibly well her business was doing. And I got really excited because. I had already interviewed dozens, if not over 100 businesses at this point, entrepreneurs at this point. And hers seemed to be a real rags to riches story, at least from what the records said. Her charcoal business had just done so well over the previous few years. And you know, I dug into the numbers with her. I asked her tough questions. I sort of did a freestyle audit <laughs> to make sure that what I was seeing was correct. And indeed, it was. She was doing phenomenally well. I looked at previous records. I mean, I checked it out. She was doing great. But I looked around her home, and I looked at her, and there were no signs of newfound wealth. And I was a little bit confused, because she had told me about her business. I had all that information. But as I asked, you know, well, goodness, how has this changed your life? That was sort of the, the point of it all, right? How has this made life better for you? She didn't have much to say. I asked if she had used the profits from her business to you know, send her daughters to school, to buy a mosquito net, to do anything. but. She said very, um, at least to me, and kind of unsatisfying answers like, no, I'm fine. My life will go on. My days will pass. She, she had nothing to show um, for her amazing business growth. And so I said, OK, look, I, where's the money? <laughs> where's, where are the profits from this business, if your records really are true? And she sort of looked around. She was a bit of a jokester. I, I was about to learn. She sort of looked around as if anyone else would even fit in this one room mud hut and would be spying on us or something, and tiptoed over to right near where her mattress was, pounded the floor, and looked at me and said, it's in the World Bank, and started to crack up. She, is, she had literally buried her money in the ground in the earthen floor next to her mattress. And so I laughed. I mean, you don't get to encounter a ton of humor when you're doing <laughs> poverty alleviation, you know, standard of living surveys. Um, not a lot of joking going on all the time, but. She was hilarious. We laughed. We talked. Um, but I, I sort of, looking back, was probably a bit obnoxious and said, really? That's, that's where your money is? <laughs> I was a, a little bit in disbelief, because I really hadn't met anybody up until that point who had done so little when they had had an opportunity to do so much more. And so since that day, we'll fast forward a little bit. You know, I interviewed many other entrepreneurs just during that assignment alone, and I've gotten to meet hundreds since. And since that day, I've really wondered, what makes some people dig and create value out of almost nothing, out of the ground beneath their feet? And yet other people, what makes other people bury their treasures and stop pushing forward, stop wanting more for themselves and their families and their lives? 
Now, by the way, a little caveat. I'm not wishing that Fatuma, Fatuma was some sort of materialist consumer. I certainly had no desire to cause her to want or worry or start to desire things um, that she couldn't have in her life, at least not anytime soon. I was just, I was disappointed and um, very confused by that sentiment that she had. She just decided to stop. So I've asked myself a lot over the years, gosh, Dig versus Barry, why, why the difference? What makes some people more like Patrick in their spirit of wanting to make something more for their lives and other people more like Fatuma? And I think the answer is not unrelated to entrepreneurship, or at least for me, my favorite def definition of entrepreneurship, and I'll tell you that first. Um, I think the, definition, the academic definition of entrepreneurship that I love the most is Howard Stevenson's, and it's this. He says that entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. And forgive me if I swoon, but I think this is a pretty romantic definition, a wonderful, passionate, beautiful definition. The pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. So it's about this pursuit. I think Patrick kept pursuing because he had a vision for the future that was different. And he believed in that vision. He believed that he could make that vision real. I think Fatuma had a vision as well, but somehow along the way stopped believing in it or stopped wanting more, stopped wanting that vision to continue to change and evolve. But this definition, right, the pursuit, it, what I love so much about it, one of the things I love is that it really emphasizes action, not possession. It's about the pursuit, not what you have not the resources on hand um, you have access to, not your network, not your pedigree or your education, none of that stuff. It's about taking step forwards, steps forward every day. And it makes that definition of entrepreneurship, it makes it very accessible to anybody that wants to choose to live that way and to work that way. So, okay, if that's my theory, <laughs> the reason Patrick's are Patrick's and Fatuma's are Fatuma's in the world, you know, is there a way to make more people like Fatuma think more like Patrick? Is that a good thing? Um, and really, at the heart of it, how do we get more people, how do we get ourselves to believe more in this vision for the future, right, that is going to be different and maybe better than the way things are today, to believe in it so much that we pursue it, even when things get difficult, even when we don't have the kinds of resources in front of us that we think we need to move forward even when it gets really, really difficult, and we all know that it does sometimes. Now, I think that that answer is we need to get better at telling ourselves the right stories about ourselves, about other people, and just about the world in general. And sometimes it means sorting through the stories that we've heard in our lives and figuring out what to keep and what to let go, figuring out how to maybe reinterpret stories we've heard in the past that perhaps we misinterpreted. And for me, I have a long list of stories that I've heard in the past that I've misinterpreted. So I know it's a little silly, kind of simplistic looking illustration, and it's supposed to be because I want to take you back to one of the first moments when I learned about poverty. And it was when I was five years old in a Sunday school class outside of um, in this sleepy old Presbyterian church outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. And this is kind of the way I saw the world. <laughs> I'm there on the left, just kidding. Um, so I remember hearing from my Sunday school teacher God bless her, she had great intentions, I believe, about poverty, and she said that, you know, people who lived in poverty needed access to something very basic, food or clothing or shelter, et cetera. Um, and she talked about several different things that the Bible said that told us sort of how we, apparently the non-poor, this group of five-year-old kids sitting on a linoleum floor <laughs> listening to her lesson, apparently we were supposed to have a response to poverty, and this is some of the stuff that she told us. On one hand, she said that God told us, Jesus told us, what you do for the least of these you do for me. And let's pause. This was super exciting for me because I was one of those kids that like wanted to do well at everything. I'm sure there are a lot of overachievers in this room too. So I wanted to get that A plus, that gold star in every possible category. I wanted to be a good daughter and a good student and really good at Sunday school, whatever that meant. <laughs> and if I thought that God had just given me this cosmic homework assignment, serve the poor and it's like, you know, high-fiving God, I was totally in. I was very excited about this. So it sounds naive, but I mean, my adrenaline started grow going. I thought, all right, this is, this is my mission. This is what I'm going to do. And I started to think about how that would work. <laughs> so I'm sitting, I'm sitting there, like, getting my game plan, getting really excited and feeling as much as I had ever felt at that time in my life, sort of called, like, okay, this is what my life should be about. I want to do something bigger than me, be a part of something bigger than myself. 
But unfortunately, my little reverie was interrupted because my Sunday school teacher went on and said something else that stopped me in my tracks, and not in a good way. She said that um, the Bible also said, and Jesus said, the poor would always be with us. And that scared the pants off of me. Because again, in my five-year-old worldview of like cartoon character Jesus and everything, I pictured <laughs> this long line of people behind me following me around forever and ever, wanting me to share my stuff with them. And while I wouldn't have used language like, well, this is unsustainable, I definitely, I definitely felt scared and, and worried about, well, this won't work out. I don't have enough stuff to give everyone all the time. And if the poor are always with us and always with me, I don't know what I'm gonna do here. So that one little moment in time, I felt two sets of emotions that quite honestly have followed me around for most of my life with respect to poverty and the poor, this group of people that we sort of otherized and put out in another category in the world. On one hand, I felt really motivated. I thought, gosh, it's important for me to, am I still in the right spot? I know I was told to like walk in the right spot, yeah? I think I'll just stay where it's a little squintier for me, okay? <laughs> I was gonna walk, I'll stay in the light. So, no pun, stay in the light. Um, so I felt like, I felt like, um, I felt very excited and very motivated like, my goodness, it's so clear to me that I should help serve the poor. And it was really inspiring. I also, though, on the other hand, felt overwhelmed, um, defeated before I even began. Like, I was being told in advance I wasn't going to get that gold star. I was going to fail because the poor would always be around. Poverty would never be solved. I felt angry. And I felt a little bit hopeless. Um, and as the other stories that I heard sort of racked up over the years, you know, a lot of them looked and felt like this. I'd see a sad picture of a sad person and a really sad, heartbreaking statistic or story alongside that person or those people. And I would very you know, accurately, as the intentions of the, um, well, I think they're well-intentioned nonprofits, but this is what they wanted me to feel. I felt guilty, I felt terrible and overwhelmed, and I felt even maybe shameful about my own relative middle-class wealth. And so what would I do? I would do whatever they told me to do, not just to help other people, but to make myself feel better, if I'm quite honest. I would call the 800 number on the screen and dig in the couch <laughs> cushions for spare change. I would have my long list of stuff that I would do, right? But I would respond in the way that I would be asked because I felt so bad, often about myself, that I wanted, again, to make myself feel a little bit better. So I would throw my change in the jar and I would go on with the rest of my day, the rest of my week, whatever it was, and I would feel a little bit better until the next sad story came along. And unfortunately, those sad stories um, had a different effect on me. Not, yeah, I was into this cycle of feel bad, 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 bad until I give and then, okay, feel better a little bit, at least temporarily. But I also developed sort of, I put up this invisible barrier between myself and these other people that I so yearned to help. Deep in my heart, again, since I was a little kid, I so longed to be important to them and to be useful in other people's lives. But I had, I had put up a wall. I actually thought I knew their stories. I'd heard them enough times, and they all sounded about the same. They were really sad, made me feel terrible. So I stopped listening, and I just kind of in a numb way stayed involved. But I didn't feel changed, and I didn't know if change was happening on the other side of things either. Okay, now I see a lot of sad faces. This is where the talk gets happy now. We're gonna, it's gonna get better starting now. <laughs> but at its worst, that's how I felt about poverty and my involvement and my ability to help. So fast forward a bunch. Um, I go to college, I study philosophy and poetry, <laughs> not business or entrepreneurship. In fact, I was quite a hate, I was kind of a hater of those things because again, just over the first few decades of my life, I thought, well, it seems to me that the organization's trying to help the poor are nonprofits, and so for-profits must be the bad guys if nonprofits are the good guys. It's, I was wrong, by the way. <laughs> the world is not that way. I made some very black and white assumptions, but I had no interest undergrad in studying business. Let's just put it that way. So I studied these other things that I, th I thought would help me ask good questions about the world and think strategically about <laughs> how power has an effect on the world um, and politics. And poetry was just good for me because I can be a talker and it was good for me to have just a few words on a page with a lot of white space. That was good. <laughs> so those are the things I loved and I studied and I graduated very much without any kind of plan. Now when I talk to college audiences, I put all these um, asterisks and I say, look, I just don't go do this and then blame it on me. This is not prescriptive. This is just what I did in my life. But I graduated without any kind of plan. I moved to California because I was in love with the boy. Again, great strategic career move. <laughs> and um, um, I ended up getting a temp job the next day at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Now remember, I just told you how I felt about business. 
I was worried for my soul. <laughs> I thought, oh man, I have to pay my rent, but like, I'm working in a business school, this is terrible, I'm, I'm gonna be influenced negatively. It turned out though that I just so happened to land, and by the way, my, again, my career sort of strategy involved printing out in Pennsylvania paper resumes, it's so old school, and walking around Stanford's campus and handing them to anybody that would give me the time of day, and that's how I got my first job. So anyway, I found myself in the business school, and in fact, in the Center for Social Innovation, which was wonderful. I just, so ha I just happened to land there. Because this was a place where, yes, people were thinking about business and entrepreneurship, but they were thinking about those things as they related to solving social problems. So there were people every day thinking about making the world better, but doing it in this very interesting way that I had never encountered before. And very quickly, I was sort of won over. I was converted. And I realized I'd, I'd found my people. And that maybe, in fact, business, maybe even entrepreneurship had something to do with making people's lives better, or at least it could. So I stayed there in that job for a few years. and. I mean, I loved it. I crashed classes, I sat in lectures, I even went to professor's office hours and said, I'm not a student, but can I ask you some questions? And I often got okays. So I stayed, um, and I also got to see a lot of amazing MBAs who went off and would do these dream jobs of mine. So I started to put the pieces together, and one day I stayed after work and heard this guy, Dr. Muhammad Yunus, give a lecture. It was in the fall of 03, three years before he would win the Nobel Peace Prize for his work pioneering modern microfinance. We can talk more about that later if you'd like. But I had heard him speak and was blown away. It was one of these aha moments, um, just like Patrick had had his, his epiphany. This was a little bit of an epiphany for me. One, I learned about microfinance for the first time. And in particular, I learned about microcredit, these small loans that could change the trajectory of someone's life at the right moment in time if they were ready for it. And if it was kind of, if all the stars aligned, it could be this incredible tool for change in their lives. So that was amazing to hear. Two, Dr. Yunus told his story in a very accessible way. He talked about being a university professor, but sort of leaving the halls of academia and sitting down with a group of women who were basket weavers in a nearby village and asking them directly, forget economic theory, asking these individuals directly why they were poor and what they thought would help. And they explained waking up every day, borrowing money from local money lenders, paying ridiculous interest rates, you know, hundreds of percentage points, if not more. Even though they were doing everything right, they would have to borrow this money, go buy the materials they needed to weave their baskets and make a great product. They would sell those products at a profit, but they would owe everything, if not more, than what they'd made that day back to the money lenders. So they were stuck in this cycle. They needed access to fair loans, to, to this little bit of capital. And so as the story goes, and I'm fast forwarding a lot and summarizing, taking my own liberties here, but he more or less reaches into his pocket and provides the whole village with a little over $20. That's all they needed. And of course they repay, not with hundreds of percentage interest rates. Um, and they repay and the rest is sort of microfinance history. They are able to start to improve things, grow their businesses and slowly lift themselves and their families to a better place, slowly moving their way out of poverty. So this great man started his work by sitting and talking to people. That was a big deal for me, this recent college philosophy grad, right? Who had no idea what to put on her resume. I thought, well, at least I could go sit and talk to people and be a really good listener and maybe respond in a common sense way. I know it was naive, but that's what I thought. So one, learned about microfinance and microcredit. Two, heard an accessible story of a great man who started his work in a way that anybody could have started. And three, most importantly, he talked about the poor in a way that I hadn't heard anyone talk about them, maybe ever. He talked about hard working, smart, strong individuals that were, again, doing things right. They just needed access to this little bit of capital. Of course, yes, they had some economic need, they were poor. But they were not the people that I had heard about growing up. They were not people that needed me to swoop in and save them. They were incredible individuals. They were entrepreneurs, which after a few years in Silicon Valley, I had been convinced was like the ultimate thing to be in the world. So I was so moved by this talk and by this reframing of poverty and potential that I quit that job at Stanford. Again, this is where I tell the college kids, like, if you do this, don't say the speaker said to do that. But I quit my job, I moved to the other side of the world, and I begged my way into this job that I told you about. 10 years ago where I met Patrick and Fatuma and so many others. And I worked interviewing entrepreneurs, asking them how $100 had changed their lives. <laughs> I was changed so much by this experience. And what happened for me was really, yes, I learned a lot about microfinance. I learned a lot about the power of micro grants and micro loans to change entrepreneurs' lives. I learned a ton about all that stuff. But honestly, a lot of the learning was very visceral, very much in my heart. I encountered people who were happy, God forbid, right? Not a carefully framed picture of somebody 
at the right moment of sadness to put on the nonprofit brochure. I met people who were happy with their lives and proud of the work they did. I met people who already had success stories underway. Maybe they had started with the needle and thread under the shade of a tree, and now they had capital equipment in an office. I met people who even just, you know, I encountered them in a scene of abundance versus scarcity. It changed how I felt about them and what I believed was true for them in their lives. And I met people, this is notable, with full hands with something to offer me, not empty ones asking for a handout again, which is what I had been taught to expect. So this changed everything for me. And so along with my co-founder, Matt, who was back in San Francisco, we started to have this conversation, a set of what if questions came up. What if more people could hear this other part of the story from these individuals or about these individuals living in poverty? What if we could you know, take pictures of them and stay in touch with them and even provide a way, if we told their stories well, we could provide a way for people to respond differently. Maybe put their stories online and, gosh, they don't want donations. Nobody asked for a handout, as I said. Some people, though, did want loans to grow their business even more. What if we took pictures of people like Sophia, put them on a little website, and then told the world about them? So that's what we attempted to do. Now, at first, let's be clear. It was seven entrepreneurs in Uganda. It was me with my camera sort of running around taking the pictures and sitting all day at a dial-up connection <laughs> in this little village. <laughs> I did, yeah, wait until the like, like electricity came on. It, it was amazing that it actually worked. Seven entrepreneurs, they needed a total of about $3,000, and we spammed our friends and family and said, hey, we think this is legal. We think this will work. We think you'll get your money back, but do you want to help out our new friends? Each of them needed three, $500 at most. Overnight, the money came in. We wired it over to Uganda, and we were off to the races. This was our pilot round of loans in what became Kiva. Over the next six months, those individuals actually did repay, and so we said, well, it worked. Our experiment worked. This is our official launch then. We'll take the word beta off of the website. We'll write our own press release and put it on our website, which, I mean, not, not a lot happened, but that's what we did, and we de declared ourselves to be officially started. That's all that happened on day one, but over the next year, other things started to happen. Some people read that press release, some other blogs um, found out about our work and started to write about it. And in November of 05, about a month after we had launched, about 300 blogs had written about our work, including two of the three most widely read in the world at the time. So somehow over that first year, people paid attention and we facilitated not just $3,000 like that pilot round, but 500,000. The next year the total was up to 15 million, the next year 40, the next year 100. We're about to cross almost $750 million in loans in these little $25 bits. Thank you. <laughs> oh no, wait, I'm gonna guess, oh good. Wait, pause, I need to drink water. Okay, so <laughs> that happened <laughs> and it's still happening and it's been a really amazing honor and privilege to have gotten to be a part of Kiva from the beginning. And by the way, there are borrowers all over the world now. There are lenders and borrowers almost in every country on the planet. And um, it's been amazing to see. They're not just individual borrowers, but group borrowers. Not just in Africa, but in my own hometown. And there are loans of all different kinds. There are loans not just for business creation, but for other entrepreneurial activities. So there's a lot to talk about with Kiva, but I'm just gonna pause there and tell you that much. Now, I've gone on to get to do other things. I left Kiva a few years ago and started a for-profit startup um, based in the US to allow US entrepreneurs to crowdfund. This was three years before it was legal. So, <laughs> so we lasted about three years and then decided to wait for the Jobs Act. Yeah, it was, it, it, we were really proud of it. But um, we did sort of a do-it-yourself, I can talk about this in Q&A, but it's sort of this do-it-yourself set of tools for entrepreneurs to raise money, investment capital, so very different than loans, especially 0% loans, <laughs> um, but investments for their startups or small businesses. I ended up doing some investing with the Collaborative Fund, which is an amazing startup fund focused on um, companies that really champion the sharing economy and collaborative consumption. You can talk more about that too if you'd like. That's been interesting. And then of course I had spent some time and wrote this book, but I've gotten to do really fun work, always focused on empowering entrepreneurs over the last decade. And I guess to kind of wrap this all up and, and conclude here, as I've, I told you that 10 years ago I started to ask this question about what makes people dig, what makes people bury. And of course I've also still asked a lot of questions about poverty. My understanding of poverty has evolved and sort of changed over time. My definition has changed a little bit and expanded 
for better and for worse, over time. I used to think it was just about material needs, food, clothing, shelter, and access to opportunity, access to information, healthcare. I think it's also about this invisible thing on the inside. Um, and I think we actually can all, we're all susceptible to at least this form of being in need, of lacking. Uh, I think some of the most sad situations I've encountered as I've worked with a variety of entrepreneurs over the last few years is sometimes I meet people who have everything that they could possibly need right in front of them. I mean, access to anything they would ever dream up, but they feel stuck. They're completely free and they feel trapped. And I think, I think this is sad as well. I mean, I think I'm just gonna guess that many of us in this room, maybe most of us in this room, have not encountered the kind of poverty that Patrick was living in and had always been living in for his life until he started to change things. Um, I certainly haven't, but the kind of lack that I encounter in my own life is really internal and it's, it's about this, uh, this kind of pausing, um, having moments where I don't believe in myself enough and I don't believe in a better future enough. And I think when that happens, when I feel trapped, even though I'm quite free, I have to tell myself, remind myself of those stories that are truer, um, not stories that sometimes are all too easy to encounter, right? Not stories that tell us that there is not great potential in every other human being on the planet. Um, not the stories that just tell us there's only one way to respond and only one way to be, or that only one little piece of us is needed to do something great in the world. I think our whole selves are required and needed. So when I get stuck, I remember people like Patrick. It's one of the reasons I wanted to write this book so that other people could have access to these kinds of stories. But I remember people like Patrick who literally made something out of almost nothing out of a resource that we all have access to, but I know for me, I've walked by or walked over it every day of my life. I don't know if I would have ever had an epiphany like Patrick did. So I, I remind myself of stories like his, and I remind myself of those stories that really tell me and convince me that there is opportunity everywhere and that there is potential everywhere. And I ask this for very selfish reasons. Um, it took me like four years to write this book because I also had three babies in the last four years, so I'm very tired. <laughs> but I ask this for selfish reasons. Oh, that's very nice. Um, it's a big blessing. Um, I ask this for selfish reasons because I really want them to grow up in a world where they hear stories more about potential than poverty, more about opportunity. Um, the lack of it, and absolutely, I want them to hear stories that leave them utterly convinced that there is endless potential within every other person that they meet and certainly within themselves. Thank you. It's totally cheating to leave the kid picture up, but I'm gonna do it. <laughs> um, um, and now we have some time for questions. I think, you guys probably already know the drill, but you can raise your hand and then people hand you a mic. And if you're impatient, you can just shout and I'll repeat it. I just made up my own rule there. But that's okay. There's a mic going on, so okay. Yeah, you can decide. Oh, I get to, oh goodness, okay. Go right here. You can shout it, I'll shout. I, is that okay? Is that really unprofessional? I don't really mind. Oh, great, yell. Hi. Um, Hi. From what you said today, you made it sound like it was sort of a, a really easy progression, and I'm 100% sure <laughs> no, it wasn't. I'm sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, can you share some of the personal obstacles you went through, or um, you know, even with your work? Absolutely. Oh gosh, I thought you meant mostly with work. You meant the kids. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, I guess I'll say this. So, remember that picture of me with the turkey and you know, hanging out with a fisherman and whatever. So I didn't see. It. <laughs> Even though I see it now, and I, understand, I can use this language of entrepreneurship to describe my own journey, I wanted to get out there and just have, I wanted to have an adventure and I wanted to learn what it meant to be a human being on this planet. I wanted to understand what was possible for people. So I was there, not with a plan very much, but I started to have these insights. And along with Matt, we started to have these ideas, these what if ideas. Actually starting Kiva was, you know, we took about nine, almost 10 months between that picture and starting. And what we ended up doing, I, I know now how to think about it, um, we're really asking the world for permission. We kind of 
put it under the heading of like, oh, we're just getting some feedback, but we got feedback for months and months and months and said, what do you think about this idea of allowing people to lend $25 to the goat herder in Uganda and get paid back? Like, do you like that idea? Why aren't you doing that idea? What are the risks? And we got a lot of pushback. Um, and it sounds pretty trite now, like, oh, there were some naysayers and that was a challenge, but it really was a challenge because we didn't, we were so young, we had no idea what we were doing. And so to hear people that we really respected in the, micro, in the microfinance world, but in, you know, as nonprofit leaders, um, bankers, lawyers, these people who were legitimate experts say it won't work, here's why. It was really disheartening and we had to figure out what to listen to because we wanted to learn, we wanted to be open and have people help us make the idea better, but it was difficult to really understand what to do with some of that feedback and some of that criticism, quite frankly. Um, so that was one thing. Uh, other challenges, we ended up growing so fast at the beginning that we couldn't keep up and so the site shut down frequently because we, I mean, we got bombarded with traffic and more, more than anything else, we ran out of loans. I mean, you hitch the rocket ship of the internet up to like the, <laughs> the slow crawl of a lot of the way the world works and the places where we were working. And, um, you know, to, it, it was this, I know now after having gone back to business school and paying for my MBA, not just being a staffer and get, I went back to Stanford and I got that MBA <laughs> and I paid a pretty penny for it. But I, I remember having this aha mo moment in an operations class. It was a supply chain problem. But so we really, we really, um, in the beginning it was a very bumpy, bumpy ride. In terms of, cause you, you um, just, you can nod if I'm getting this right. The like whole picture, personal, professional, everything. Um, is that an interesting general category too? Well, I'll just say challenges there, personal challenges, as you asked. Um, I'll say two. So one, I um, I felt it was it was difficult for me to leave <laughs> the organization. I definitely left at a moment when I was unsure what would come next, uh, and I had to have this re recalibration period, I guess, and to redefine who I was, not just this person who was doing Kiva, but as an entrepreneur more generally. And that was a scary moment of growth for me, really scary. Um, it's easy to talk about kind of in summary now, but it was, it was terrifying. I had to figure out if I was going to trust myself to try again. And so I had to do that. And I think now I'll come right up to the present moment. I don't know that it's a challenge so much as an, a daily sort of thing that I, I have to just really work hard at and get right. Sometimes, especially women ask, oh, how do you balance everything? You know, I wrote this book, I've been doing some consulting, my three wonderful kids, my wonderful husband and our marriage. I have, oh, there's a lot. And I think instead of trying to have it all, what I've done is just harshly prioritize and get really comfortable saying no to stuff. And that took me a while too. I, I don't know if people have heard this example before, but I heard, I heard this, I, I think a year and a half ago, somebody was <laughs> giving a lecture talking about the MacBook Air and how in, in a product sense, they had to just say, these are our design principles. We're gonna absolutely be great at some things and just suck at other things. So <laughs> the MacBook Air is really light and it's great. There's things that are, it's great at, right? But it doesn't have a, dis it doesn't have a, a drive for anything. It, it lacks a lot of like features that some people would like and wish they had or want, want in their product. It just decided to be really good and specialize at, I mean, not the product decided, but the team decided to make it great at some stuff and bad at other things. I feel like that's how I look at my life right now. I wanna be a great partner to my husband. I wanna be a great mom. I wanna be great at the few things that I'm doing in my work and everything else. It's just not on the list or it's way, way down the list. Did I answer your question? You can quality control here, yes? Yeah, okay. Isn't that not, yeah. Write down stuff that you don't mind being terrible at and be really okay with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, oh, I'm supposed to call on people. Oh my gosh, I think you were doing, I was just watching you, I'm sorry. Thank you. How difficult was it when you Yeah, how difficult was it to leave? It was um, extremely difficult at the time to leave Kiva, but I feel like, like anything, uh, sometimes you just have to make the move and then figure it out along the way. That's probably one of my top strategies in life. <laughs> jump and then figure it out. <laughs> so that's what I did. I actually, I, I did do something I think very wise in retrospect. I took about three and a half months and I went and I lived by myself. This was pre my husband, um, pre Reza. But I, I lived by myself uh, on a beach in Mexico and surfed every day and basically journaled and like 
you know, figured myself out. I just, I had to, I had to recalibrate. I keep coming back to that word, but I had to find my center again and figure out who I was without my, my go-to sort of sense of identity, which I realized had been perhaps a little bit too much in, um, in work. And so work is one part, but there are other parts too now <laughs> of who I am and how I see myself in the world. So it took me a little while to recalibrate, but I think having that time of reflection um, and prayer and uh, you know, just really getting healthy as much as I possibly could was an amazing thing for me. So that's what I would recommend. I mean, I know you can't all go live on a beach in Mexico and surf for three months, but if you can, I would rec that would be one prescriptive thing about <laughs> my journey. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jessica. Maybe another round of applause oh, for it. U.S. Consulate. I believe there's representatives here in the front row somewhere. If you could stand up. Huge supporters for, of this evening. And just coming here. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank Ty, the Indus Entrepreneurs. Once again, we can't do this without your support. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. Tonight is actually Jessica's launch of her book, Clay Water Brick. So she will be downstairs. Uh, signing uh, the book and there will be copies for sale in the lobby and um, we hope we see more of you at the rest of the events throughout the festival we have uh, jeans and jazz tomorrow at the Vancouver Playhouse and our 5x15 on Saturday